Yo and hello everybody, Mike Moynihan here with another episode of the Golden Age of Cardboard podcast. Wow, it is that time of year and I've, I've been mentioning this. We are in mid-December and it is Hall of Fame season. So we're going to do some talk around that today and hopefully take a little bit different angle with it. Uh, talking through kind of some of the Hall of Fame processes and thoughts that collectors, you know, can have, I would, I would say should have, but everybody's going to do their own thing. So that's not, I'm not trying to say this is how you have to do it. It's more, Hey, here's some things you, you could think about if, if you're collecting and, and love hall of famers the way that I do. But a first bit of housekeeping, uh, it is so funny. You guys out there, uh, through my Instagram, y'all are pretty great about, Hey, are you coming out with an episode this week? And I know this episode's coming out late in the week. I wish I could tell you I am so good of a podcaster that I have a schedule that I can do every week and it's going to come out on this day at this time and whatever. I wish I could tell you that, but I, I can't tell you that. I have a lot of other stuff going on in life and I'm trying to do an episode a week for sure. Uh, but I am going to tell you guys there won't be another episode until after the holidays, till after the new year, because I am going to be spending a lot of time with family. My kids are home from college and there's just a lot going on and traveling and whatnot. So I'm just not going to have time to do episodes. It's not that y'all aren't important and that I don't want to uh, diminish that, but at the same time, got to do what you got to do. Uh, so, so much support from everybody. And I get a lot of messages on my Instagram, which is at baseball collector, Mike, all one word on my Instagram. You can go look. And the most recent post that I made is a hall of fame ballot. It's the writer's ballot. It's the actual names that the writers got to make their ballots. And I want to see what the community thinks, what everybody out there thinks about who should and shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. So you can go there and vote. You have to put your email in just so I know that people aren't voting more than one time, just to try to keep it as reasonable and, and legit as possible. It doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things, but it's I think it'd be really cool to see what everybody thinks. So the link for that is on my Instagram. If you're listening on podcast, if you are watching on YouTube, I'll put a link to it down below and you can go vote. Please only vote once. And it'll just be fun to see how close we get to what the writers think about who should be in the hall of fame for the class of 2022. All right. Let's talk about a, a subject that I, that I talk about kind of in an ancillary manner all the time, because it's something I think about all the time. But I want to do a specific episode since we're in the season of Hall of Fame. And I wanted to bring a guest on that, that I have been remiss not to ever have on the show. He is a guy that has as much passion and love for the Hall of Fame as I do. I know several guys like that in the community. And this guy hadn't been on the show. So I thought I'd have him on this episode to talk Hall of Fame stuff. And it's Jake. Jake, are you there? Merry Christmas, everybody. It's Hall of Fame season. <laughs> It is Hall of Fame season. Merry Christmas to you, Jake. How are you, man? Uh, doing fantastic, Mike. Excited to be here. Uh, can't go wrong talking Hall of Fame, right? That's right. Uh, the artist formerly known as the Ticket Leprechaun. That's right. Now your channel is called Legends Never Die on YouTube. Uh, I know you're on, you do a lot of stuff on Instagram too, under Legends Never Die also. Is that the your handle? Legends Never Die Collection on Instagram. There you go. So... Make sure you're following Jake uh, and a little tidbit for you YouTube watchers. Jake and I have a special announcement coming early next year that I think, uh, well, just wait for it. Wait for it. But Hall of Fame time, man. This is you and I just get giddy and we, you know, we're texting each other and we're talking and like, oh, let's see how to look at the voting. And mm -hmm. for, for those of you that don't know, uh, there's a way to track what's happening with the writer's vote. And I, and I thought I'd share this real quick because I'm going to use it to reference names and kind of statuses of some things. But I'm going to pull this up. At least if you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see this. Uh, for those of you listening on the podcast, it is if you go to Google and just type not Mr. Tibbs with two B's Hall of Fame, you will find this. And this is his tracker. And he does a great job with his team of mining the, the data from Twitter and Facebook and websites and all kinds of stuff to track what's going on in the Hall of Fame vote. Right now, 27 ballots have been made public. 
Uh, th those will increase significantly over the next mm -hmm. few weeks. So if you want to follow along uh, and see of the almost 400 votes, how things are tracking, this is a pretty good indicator of where things end up. So it, it's a good thing to track. And it's just fun if you love Hall of Fame stuff like I do to check that out. So again, I'll be referencing that a lot as will Jake. Mm -hmm. We've got baseball reference up. There's so many great reference tools out there to kind of formulate your own opinions. And I know Jake, you have a lot of opinions about the Hall of Fame. What what about the Hall of Fame and Hall of Fame collecting do you do you love? What makes you so passionate about it? So my th favorite thing about tracking everything to do with the Hall of Fame and, and collecting Hall of Famers is you can't tell the history of the game without its greatest players. And I see my collection uh, ultimately someday as a museum to the game of baseball. Uh, and it's largely centered around Hall of Famers. Uh, so the process of being able to watch who is getting in uh, who or who I think will get in and, and trying to kind of prospect Hall of Famers ahead of time is exciting uh, for me. I know you mentioned in one of your recent videos, you know, you're excited that six guys got in. You know, you've got six new players that you may not have collected before that now you will, um, whether that is good or bad, because it's going to cost you some more money. <laughs> uh, but collecting the game's greatest players, you know, their stats are done. They're going to be in the Hall of Fame forever. Uh, so that's something that can't be taken away from them, at least not so far. No one's been kicked out of the hall. I guess it's possible, right? But <clears throat> it would take something weird to happen. Uh, I feel the same passion as you. And when I started gravitating towards Hall of Fame collecting 12 to 15 years ago, I'd always loved the Hall of Fame and loved the history of the game. But I finally had a a way to or just focused on that instead of current players, mm -hmm. I started going, man, this is a dead end road most likely. Right. And we talk about prospecting and we're going to talk about prospecting hall of famers today, because when I was a kid, you know, you'd want to buy the current players and I get it. Like mm -hmm. no, no judgment on people that love modern stuff and love collecting Acuna mm -hmm. and Otani and trout and all those guys. They're, they're great player. I'm not, mm -hmm. not belittling that, but to me, it was such a smarter slash, long-term deal to collect hall of famers if that makes any sense at all uh i felt like this is something i can do forever i don't have to worry about this player getting hurt or right domestic abuse or going on drugs or whatever right mm -hmm. any of that stuff it, these were the legends of the game and they never die according to your channel name that's right uh but and they don't and that's that's a great name for your channel legends never they don't ever die they're, they're always great players mm -hmm. Forget about the value aspect, which really makes sense because Hall of Famers tend to hold their value long term. They don't grow as much. There's not as many spikes and peaks and valleys, but they're the they're the tortoise, right? Right. In the tortoise and the hare analogy of sports cards. So it's hard to go wrong, right? As right. our friend Eric says, it's never bad to buy a Hall Hank Aaron rookie. Well, you could say that probably about any Hall. Never bad to buy a Hall of Famer card, right? Mm -hmm. When uh, uh, to, to touch on the value part, Mike, you know, to be on the end of the spectrum where I'm, I'm a lot younger than you are. I had to get that in there. Uh, you are. And I have a newborn son at home and that kind of thing. So my funds are more limited than a lot of people. Uh, but since I have a focus on Hall of Famers, you know, if I buy Hall of Fame cards, whether it's vintage, autographs, rookies, autograph baseballs, whatever it may be, you know, that's to me well spent money like the odds of any of it losing its value. And it's not all about money, but the odds of it losing any of its value and that being like a bad buy is very unlikely. You know, I've never regretted a single uh, purchase that I've made of all famer, you know, not a one. Right. Uh, so I think that's something that I, it makes me feel more comfortable about the money that I do invest in the hobby of things that I, I want to keep. For sure. And, and there's, so much truth to that. And you are younger and it's great to see younger guys loving the history of the game, like us old farts, you know, and, and I really love that about you and several other guys in the, I mean, we're a pretty close knit group of hall of fame crazies, aren't we? You know, we, yes. and, but there's, there's more and more of us coming out of the woodworks. It's, it's pretty cool to see through mediums like YouTube and podcasting and things. I get a lot of people that, Oh, I love what 
I, I do stuff just like you. And I never knew that other people did. And it, it's, it's pretty terrific. For those of you out there that don't under, may not understand, or I always try to teach a little bit during these shows and share knowledge, but two different ways that people can get in the hall of fame, right, Jake, mm -hmm. yep. you've got the era committees and there's multiples of those. I'm not going to belabor that point, but there are era committees that are voted on uh, annually, typically this year, we had two of them just because one was delayed because of COVID last year. Right. And then we have the writer's ballot every year. Mm -hmm. Now, when you prospect hall of famers and you're thinking who might be in later, why should we even care? Like, why don't, why not just wait to see who gets elected Jake? And then, you know, whether it's through an error committee or the writer's ballot and just buy them then. Well, I think from a, a collector standpoint, you know, typically a collector cares less about money, right? You're not in the investing and flipping and all that. However, if you're a Hall of Fame guy and you're going to want to collect Hall of Famers like Mike and I do, regardless of when they get in, it makes good financial sense to get in on the potential future Hall of Famers sooner rather than later. I mean, we see it year after year, Mike. You've been in the hobby even longer than I have. Every year, without fail, guys get in. They spike way up, which it's the worst time. I know Frank said it's the worst time to buy these cards right after they get in. And typically they come back down a little bit, but then they plateau most of the time above where they were before. Uh, right. Especially if you were able to purchase them in a period where, you know, they're underrated in terms of their all time resume. But at the specific window that they're playing right now, people feel they're overrated. The example that I always think of is Albert Pujols. So for the past you know, five or so years, people have been like, oh, Albert Pujols' contract, it's terrible. He's killing the Angels. You know, Until he gets gone, Mike Trout's never going to win anything. And then he gets cut from the Angels and he signs with the Dodgers. During that time period was the perfect time to buy Albert Pujols stuff because he's arguably a top five hitter of all time. He is a lock of a lock of a lock of a Hall of Famer. Uh, and pre-pandemic, right before everything started with that, was when I bought my Pujols rookie. And regardless of the pandemic effect on it, those were going to go up. There's no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that's something that I like to do of buying the, the post-hype guy that when, you know, Miggy was winning a triple crown and all of that, and he was in the news all the time. His cards were very expensive. But since that time to now, when he's still playing, he hasn't been as hot. That's when I bought my stuff for him. He's a lock. You know, he's already got the 500 homers and he's going to get 3,000 hits this coming season. Yeah. So <clears throat> I think if you're a collector out there thinking through the different phases of players that you can look at right now, you got active players that you can prospect for the Hall of Fame. You've got recently retired that aren't on the ballot guys. Mm hmm. And then you've got the other two, you know, writer's ballot guys that are still eligible, eligible to be voted in by the writers. And then you've got the era committee guys. And I think there is some nuance and tricks you can think about or just I think you need to think about them differently for each of those four categories where players might fall at any given time during, you know, history or whatever. Sure. Active players now. Right. I mean, you. Obviously, Pujols is technically no longer active, but Pujols, you said, Miguel Cabrera, um, finding those dead times of their career where they're less thought of. Like Kershaw right now is probably a pretty good buy because so. it's a good time to pick up Kershaw stuff because he was injured and where's he going to go? And he's getting in the Hall of Fame right now. He could not ever pitch again. He's in the Hall of Fame. Or, or, Ver, or Verlander, who hasn't pitched in every year. Yes. Right. Verlander, uh, Scherzer, you know, Zach Grink. Then you take a guy like Zach Grinky and you go, well, mighty or might not he get in the Hall of Fame? I, I don't know, but I own his rookie. I bought his rookie card because it's cheap. I do too. I do too. Right? It's so cheap right now. It's worth the, the shot if he does wind up being a Hall of Famer. If not, he's really good and yeah. you didn't have to invest a lot of money to do it versus the cost that that might be. If he, if he has a great season again or starts getting some of those counting stats and yeah. milestones in his career, and then you go, oh, crap, I missed the boat on that. Um, so 
you can do that with active players. And I think that's incredibly smart to look for periods where that player just might be less thought of in the hobby. Mm -hmm. It's kind of forgotten almost, right? Absolutely. We forgot how great Albert Pujols was. <laughs> and his, they don't look at his career. It's all, what have you done for me lately with active right. players, which is great for guys like us because we just go, they haven't done anything lately, but oh man, their body of work is worthy uh, by picking up their stuff. So I think that's one area, right? Then right. let's talk about the quote unquote recently retired guys that are still in that five year window. You have to be retired five years until you can go onto the writer's ballot for people that may not know. And we've got some players right now that are in that window that I think are incredibly compelling. Uh, you would certainly make Beltray has got to be a first ballot guy. There you go. Beltray autograph you're showing there. I'm a big Beltray guy anyway. I I got to watch him play every day and I'm telling you, he's unbelievable. So he's the first guy I think of within that window because his 3000 hits were probably the quietest 3000 hits of all time. No one talked about it. Yeah. And you know, him being in the time frame you're talking about when he was a quiet 3000 hit guy, when he was playing, now he's been retired. What has it been like three years? He retired in, after 18. So, Three seasons. Yeah. Okay, so three seasons. In my opinion, it's the perfect time to buy Beltre. He's a slam dunk Hall of Famer in that exclusive club, and he's fairly affordable because he's not a huge hype guy, especially in this time frame. Right. Uh, the, the first guy I think about isn't Beltre, ironically. It's Ichiro. To me, he's an absolute no-brainer. There's your Ichiro <laughs> autograph. Uh, he's a no-brainer to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, his stuff is still pretty popular just because he was pretty popular in the hobby. Mm -hmm. Right. And he doesn't have a ton of autographs out there. Uh, by the way, Beltre's rookie card is 97 in, things in 97 Bowman's best is kind yeah. of his well, most well-known rookie card. Ichiro stuff is Oh one, which is the same as pool holes. Mm -hmm. You've got tops and there's all kinds of rookie cards for both of those guys in Oh one. Um, so, you know, do your homework, do your research, find out when these guys played, go. If you collect autographs, go, go buy them now. If you collect rookie cards, go get them now. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are two guys I can think of off the top of my head, kind of in that not yet eligible window, retired, but not yet eligible window that just really come to mind. And then you got the writer's ballot. And this is where what we didn't want to do here is go through each name and say yes or no to their hall of fame candidacy in our humble opinions. What right. we've learned what I, and Jake, maybe you can speak to this. I'll, I'll make a point and then maybe you can follow up with your uh, thoughts on this, but I have learned that you never know who's going to get in. Mm -hmm. There's a few guys, you know, are going to get Jeter Rivera, right? There's guys, you know, are going to get in, but then there's the guys that you don't know. And I've taken the tack that, there's guys that I think should get in. That doesn't mean they will. And there's guys that I think shouldn't get in. It doesn't mean they won't. And so I'm going to collect as many of them as I think are reasonable mm -hmm. uh, on the ballot just to have them just in case Ted Simmons. I didn't think Ted Simmons was going to get, Hey, here we are. Uh, Harold Baines is in whether I agree with it or not is irrelevant. He's in the hall of fame and therefore I want to collect him. It's not that I have to. I, I, that's a key differential. I want to. Good. Hall, Harold Baines is in the Hall of Fame. Do I agree with that? No. There's a lot of guys in the Hall of Fame that I don't agree that they should be in. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean they're not. So what do you think about that idea that uh, collect everybody because you never know? Sure. So I guess the first point I want to tackle on that, not I won't get like super in the weeds about it. But quickly, I'm not a steroid guy, for example, right? If, if you – did steroids, I wouldn't vote for you. They don't care what my vote is, though. Um, to be a writer for the BBWAA, you have to write for an accredited newspaper or website for 10 years. And that's how you get credited to vote. I looked that up in my mid-20s thinking I might, you know, somehow sneak in a writing career so that I could actually vote for the Hall of Fame. Uh, but that's probably not going to happen. Uh, but I say that to say I still collect those guys. And how I go about it is I collect the major milestone clubs, regardless of Hall of Fame, right? So Bonds, 500 homers, Sosa, McGuire, those guys are all in that club. So I collect them anyways. 
And to me, being in those big milestone clubs give you a lot better odds of potentially being a Hall of Famer someday. And I said the first bit about the steroids because I want it to lead to this. If I had a vote, I wouldn't vote for them. However, if Bonds gets in here early in 2022, I say you let them all in. You know, I, I don't really paint it as a gray area thing. If there's one guy known to or highly be, you know, suspected of using PEDs that gets in the hall, I'm for letting them all in. I don't think you can punish them all to different degrees. It, to me, it should be a yes or no thing. So I have the Sheffields. I have the Manny Ramirez's. I have the A-Rods because I'm going to collect the Hall of Fame. And I'll celebrate those guys just like any of the other ones, the Harold Baines, the Barry Bonds's, or the Chipper Jones, all the same. They all still would say Hall of Fame next to right. him, right? That's right. So Bonds and Clemens are interesting cases. They're on their last year on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's well-documented controversy surrounding them. We don't need to go into it here. No. But collecting them, like you said, is probably pretty smart, just for a lot of reasons, that they were great. They were absolutely great. Now, there are people that take a no tolerance stance, so to speak, on steroids, and you're more than entitled to do that. Sure. But if you're going to get a Clemens card, you know, his 84 update is a great card to have for Clemens. His autographs are pretty inexpensive, honestly, uh, for Clemens, and there's a lot of them out there. For Barry Bonds, uh, there's, I have an 80, I have a bunch of Bond cards, but his 86 Fleer update is an example, his 87 Don Russ. There's his. I need that card, by the you way. You have this card, Mike? I don't. I need it really it's bad. It's a 2016 five star autograph of Barry yeah. Bonds. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Uh, there's a lot of way, you know, lots of rookies, lots of stuff you can get. Uh, the set registries will, if, if you care about that, they have specific cards. Like the, for, ba for Barry Bonds, his 86 Fleer update is the card du jour for Barry Bonds on all of the rookie card set registries and stuff like that. Uh, but I like his 87 tops, you know, his 86 tops traded, you know, all those are great cards. You can't go wrong with those. Um, and then you've got, go ahead. If, Jake. Sorry. I want to interject there for a second. If bonds and Clemens do get in the hall of fame, it's the only thing missing from the resumes. I mean, there's no way their stuff doesn't go up if they do get in, you know, a lot of people would argue that bonds is the best player ever. You know, it, the Hall of Fame thing is the only thing missing from his resume. It would be silly if you ever want to own Bonds or Clemens stuff and you don't buy before they potentially get in here soon, uh, you know, miss opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, then you have guys, I'm, I'm trying to go through the guys that are on their last year on the ballot. Uh, Schilling's another one. He is, he has, what's good about Schilling is he only has one rookie card, his 89 Donruss. You're showing, I have that same five-star autograph as well, uh, 2016. But he has one rookie card, 89 Donruss. So that's easy to get and super cheap, especially after what he said last year about not wanting to be inducted by the writers. He said, I'll just wait for the error committees. Some people said he doesn't want to be in the Hall of Fame. He doesn't care about it. That is not true at all. I, I think he cares very much. I just think he doesn't care about the opinions of the writers and kind of dug himself a hole that we'll see. I, I don't know that he'll get out of it. He may have to go to the, to the era committees down the road, but I also have his 89 Donruss rookie card autographed as nice. well. Uh, I picked that up last year after he didn't get in. Right. So once he failed everything, right. Mm -hmm. I picked it up because not now doesn't mean not ever. And that's, why I think it's so important to, if you think the player is a hall of famer, regardless of political views, being a jerk to the writers, whatever you think it might be, get their stuff when you have opportunities to do that. When th uh, that's a great point, Mike, that you touched on with shilling of, I think of another player that's on the ballot right now uh, that in some people's eyes, he will be a future hall of famer, but right now he's the other person right now that has lost the most votes so far amongst returning voters, and that's Omar Vizquel. Uh, you know, he's got 25 plus 100 career hits, and he's one of four players currently not in the Hall of Fame that have 10 or more gold gloves. So 
He's going through some different things off the field right now. Uh, he's losing votes. Could he be a Hall of Famer someday still? I don't know. But I think that his prices and his stuff and reputation has taken a hit. So if you think he's a future Hall of Famer, good time to buy. Yeah. I think it's, it's an important point to make, too, to look at guys and say, uh, sorry about Norman there barking. Uh, there's guys you can look at on the ballot and go, no, I don't, I don't see them ever getting in. Uh, not to look, if you're on the ballot, I think it's an honor quite frankly, yes. but guys like Tim Hudson and Tory Hunter and Mark Burley. And I, I'm sure there are fans of those players that think, of course there are hall of famers, but if, if you're realistic about it, it's probably not going to happen. I don't think Papel bond is going to be a hall of famer anytime soon. And they're certainly not going to get in on the writer's ballot. And so the point of that is you got a decade of them being on the writer's ballot. Potentially, if they get more than 5%, they get to stay on. So you have my point is you'll have plenty of time. If those guys do gain momentum down the road, like a Scott Rowland, for example, mm -hmm. he was a guy early on that I never thought this guy shouldn't. I don't I don't see him as a Hall of Famer. He started gaining momentum in the writer's ballot. And I'm like, wow, he's he's kind of getting to a point where he's on a trajectory where come year seven, eight, nine on the ballot, he, he might get in. He's kind of doing the Larry Walker thing, right? Kind of moving up every year. So I did pick up a Scott Rowland rookie card while it was cheap. I think I paid 15 bucks for this or something, $20 maybe. Uh, his rookie is a 95 Bowman's Best. Uh, I have it in a mint nine, you know why not? And I bought a couple of autographs of his while they're super cheap, right? Well, okay. And if he doesn't get in now, he might get in later on the era committees, right? Right. So let's talk about the two first timer guys. Um, Cause we could talk literally all day about the Todd Helton's and the Manny Ramirez is, you know, Gary Sheffield, Sosa, do they deserve to be on, not deserve to be on? They've all been on the ballot for a long time. Uh, and I have my opinions. You have yours. What's great about you and I, by the way, that people should know is we don't agree on a lot of stuff. No, we don't. <laughs> um, and that's okay. That's the great thing about the Hall of Fame debate Absolutely. is uh, you can have a respectful dialogue conversation about the Hall of Fame state a case. And that doesn't mean everybody's going to agree with you. And the great thing is it doesn't really matter because we have no say in it at the end of the day anyway. No. So getting mad at each other because we disagree or whatever would be just silly. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause at the end of the day, we, we have no say, um, but it's still fun to debate. And we, you and I have great discussions about it. And Absolutely. When no even, even the writers themselves that actually vote on the ballot, do you think all 400 and something, Writers have the same exact opinion and how they go about how they evaluate the Hall of Fame? No, of course no not. not at all. And, and that's part of what makes it great. I mean, it's very difficult to get 75% of 400 and something professional sports writers to agree who Hall of Famers are, much sure. less, you know, anybody that you may have a one on one debate with. You know, it's that's what makes it part of the fun, like you said. Exactly. Um, so the two new guys on the ballot that I think people should, if you're, if you're not collecting these people and you want to prospect hall of famers, you need to prospect these two guys. The first one's David Ortiz. I think of the, all the first timer guys, he has the best chance of getting elected this year. I would agree. Uh, he's not a slam dunk. Like a lot of people think he is. Uh, I think there's enough controversy surrounding Ortiz's career that there's going to be a lot of people hesitant to vote for him. If the voting ended today, based on the spreadsheet, he would be in but there's only 7% of the votes in. So there's a long way to go. Uh, but collecting Ortiz stuff, I was shocked, Jake, when I was at the Dallas show mm -hmm. a couple months ago, I guess it was October. And I was able to buy, I bought two or three Ortiz autographs for docked and thrilled to be able to do that. Uh, I do have one that's, that's encased and slabbed and, and this one's numbered to 25. And I don't think I paid a lot for this one back in the day. His rookie card though is expensive. 
It is. And I even, I remember the video you shot of finding those autographs at the Dow show. And I believe I commented on there. I was like, wow, that that's like a steal. Yeah. yeah that's a great deal for Ortiz, a 500 home run club member and a beloved figure, which helps him on the ballot despite some of his controversy. And, you know, that's why I've got his, uh, 2015 five-star autograph here I'm showing. Awesome. But I think you're right. I think he's shockingly undervalued somehow. A good time to buy Ortiz. Right. Except for his rookie is not, I will tell Except you. Except for the rookie. It's... Um, which he has two main ones, 97 Fleer Tradition and 97 Fleer Ultra, uh, where he's named David Arias, oh, yeah. just so everybody knows. Uh, and so those aren't cheap in high grade. You can find them, but they're going to cost you. And I don't have those yet because of the cost. I've been like, ah, but it's, it's kind of the do it now or pay more later. Right. It's <laughs> that's well, even, kinda... even at the opposite end of the spectrum here, where I, you know, collect raw cards uh, and I want a raw David Arias uh, rookie card compared to other nineties rookies in the same era as him it's a lot more expensive. And I'm like, ah, it's, you know, a, a late mid nineties rookie card. Do I really want to spend 20, 25 bucks on it or whatever it is. And, but you're right. If I don't eventually pull the trigger, I do think he's going to be a hall of famer someday. Uh, so why wait? My genuine hope is that he doesn't get in this year, that he's close mm -hmm. and his stuff drops. And then he gets in next year or the year after that. That's kind of what I'm hoping happens because, and it, it's only a hope because I've, I feel like I've kind of missed the boat uh, on his stuff. Uh, and the other guy is a rod who is besides Clemens and bonds, easily the most controversial person on the ballot because of his accomplishments, because he was indeed suspended for PEDs versus the other guys who were, widely speculated and most likely did, but never proven. A-Rod was, he was busted twice, twice. twice. <laughs> and you can argue both sides of that fence. Uh, hey, he, he got busted. He paid his time. Mm -hmm. He came back, you know, whatever. Uh, the argument of, well, if steroids gave him 20% more, 25% more homers or RBIs or whatever that he might not have had or, and allowed him to play in more games because he healed quicker, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, reduce his stats by some number and he's still a Hall. You know, mm. all of those are, are arguments that you hear floating out there. To me, A-Rod is a Hall of Famer, uh, but a lot of people are not going to vote for him. And he's, you know, kind of that known as a jerk, right? And he's done a lot, I think in his broadcasting career to remedy that because he's actually pretty good. <laughs> like if you watch him on the broadcast, he's really good mm -hmm. and he seems likable in all of these things. I think he's trying to repair some of that public image mm -hmm. damage that he did while he was playing being all surly and jerky and whatever his rookie card to own is his 94 SP foil. It's kind of the, although he's got, I don't know, eight, nine, 10. His first tops card wasn't, isn't till like 96, I think, or something. Yeah, it sounds right. 96, 97, maybe even. But, I've got uh, his uh, autographs handy here. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a bunch of them. What's funny though is A Rod stuff. I'll only buy his autograph unless it's on a five star card mm -hmm. uh, when he's pictured with the Rangers. As terrible of a time that that was being a Rangers fan. I want to have autographs of any hall of famers that played for the Rangers while they played for the Rangers. Vladimir Guerrero only played here one year, but I have a bunch of him. He had a bunch of autographs that year in tops products. And I have a bunch of them because I just love seeing hall of famers in a Rangers uniform. It's hometown bias. Probably. I do but. this. I do the same thing. I've got Sheffield in a Braves uni autograph uh, for my collection because you know, he played for the Braves for a couple of years the same idea and talking about a rod and pretty much how the writers are going to treat him. I've thought for years with bonds and Clemens after the first couple years that I'm like, just gut feeling. I don't know anything. I don't know anybody, but I felt for years that writers were going to punish them by not voting for them until the last year. Like that was the, some of the writers way of, Hey, this is your punishment. You're going to have to wait a decade to get in. 
Now, how much truth there is to that or not, we'll see after this year's vote. But I think if that happens to them, I anticipate the th same thing happening to A-Rod uh, just because they're similar, even though some could argue that his was much worse being actually busted twice. Um, and at that point, though, we would be 20 years separated from when Bonds and Clemens, you know, started their ballot process. So yeah. maybe things soften between now and then more PED speculated or PED positive guys get in between now and then. And that stigma could change. For sure. And I think it will, as you have younger guys be. that, that I think it's an inevitability, as a matter of fact, that guys will think of that as less of a big deal. Mm -hmm. The further we get along in time, memories fade, uh, bitterness fades, right? Or, and, or people that didn't actually experience the, the pain of that. Sure. You know, for example, uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you may talk about a player that you saw growing up, you know, in the in the 80s that I never saw that is a borderline Hall of Famer. And you say, man, I watched him play. He was a Hall of Famer when you watched him. There was no doubt where I have no emotional attachment to that positive or negative, And I just see the numbers. So with the PED guys, you know, if you didn't live through that era and feel the pain and disappointment of when that happened, you just see the numbers and you say, Bonds has the most home runs all time. This is silly. Put him in, you know, or Clemens. He has seven Cy Youngs. That's incredible. Like put him in. And I think that you're right that if, especially if you didn't experience these things at the time that you're less likely to hold a grudge or put someone on a, on a pedestal because of that, it becomes more black and white over time. Yeah. A lot of people feel that way. As you're mentioning, like Dale Murphy, for example, mm -hmm you know, that feel he's, I watched him. He was great. And all of this Lou Whitaker, uh, by the way, great guys to prospect because their stuff's cheap. Absolutely. And, and they might get in someday. Uh, you know, guys like that. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with your point about that becoming out of sight. I don't, you know, if you didn't experience it being much less of a big deal than the guys who did the people who did, um, now let's get into a little bit about, well, first I want to bring up a point that was just made glaringly obvious to a lot of us collectors out there at the last era committee vote that was announced on December 5th. I believe it was December 6th, something like that mm -hmm. earlier this month. If you had told me Dick Allen was not going to be elected to the hall of fame, I would have called you a liar. And what are you crazy? And of course, Dick Allen's going to again. He missed it by one vote the last time that era committee met. Certainly, he's going to get voted in now. His rookie card was blowing up cost wise. Mm -hmm. And I still don't have one, by the way. Me neither. Because I was like, I'm just not paying that. I'm just not. And I'll, I'll wait. And I also think, and but uh, sorry, I'm trying to make too many points at one time. I'm going to end up confusing myself. <laughs> Let me finish the Dick Allen point. Had people put a lot of money at these high prices and guys, they were sure we're going to get in the hall of fame. And at the moment I was sure he was going to get in. Mm -hmm. Whoops. You know, but it's not necessarily a mistake. It's not a whoops forever. You just might've overpaid a little bit. Do I think Dick Allen ultimately gets in the hall of fame? Someday, yes, I do. It's, he's gonna have to wait at least five years till that committee meets again. Um, so those mistakes, you know, there are times when you're gonna be buying guys and thinking, yeah, they're getting in, and then they don't. So there's that too. There's the surprises on the yes, they got in. Whoa, they, who got in? What? And the guys that for sure they're gonna get in, and then they don't. Agreed. Agreed. As as the ultimate and resident. Dick Allen detractor in the YouTube community. Uh, if you saw my recent uh, video on the ballots before they came out, I wouldn't vote for him, but even I said he was going to get in this last ballot and he didn't. Now, like you mentioned, it may not be a bad thing because down the road, a lot of people, a lot of people still think he's going to get in and he's been very close because on the flip side, think about if you were a hall of fame prospector 20 years before you and I, Mike, and you buy Gil Hodges 
at the same time that he just barely missed a couple years in a row, right? Just like Dick Allen. Only guy ever to get over 50% of the ballot and didn't eventually get in. I mean, he hasn't even managed for, what, 50 years? And now, Gil Hodges is in. And before we got on you know, the video here, we were talking about, man, can't believe neither one of us had a Hodges before this. Guess we'll have to wait a while because now prices are crazy because he finally got in. And the same exact thing could happen with Dick Allen. It might not be the next time he's on the era's ballot. It could be the second time after that. You don't know. But if you think that he's a likely Hall of Famer, it's probably a never time, a bad time to buy. Yeah. What's another, the, yes, you might be wrong now. You, again, that doesn't mean you're wrong forever. Mm -hmm. What's really great though, about all the hype around Dick Allen and Gil Hodges and Minnie Minoso and all these different players and Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens is the, the hall of fame prospecting does a couple of things. It makes way more cards available of that person. Typically mm -hmm. when there's talk around it and then there's hype around it, uh, you saw a lot more Dick Allen cards being listed on eBay, raw and graded. I'm a graded guy. Jake's a staunch raw guy. So we, again, like I said, you can be great friends and not see eye to eye on everything. And that's great. I love that Jake buys raw ones because he's not competing with me for the graded ones. But and I like you buying the graded ones because you're not competing on my raw. Exactly. But the, the, we share the passion and that's the key that right. people need to take from this. But it does create this wave of cards being available, whether it's rookie cards and autographs and, you know, uh, I did, you know, get caught not having some things of some guys and seeing them on eBay. Finally, once they got elected to the Hall of Fame for a graded guy, now that they're Hall of Famers, you're going to see a lot more cards being sent in to be graded uh, because they now command a higher premium. And it becomes not necessarily at today's prices of grading, but, you know, at some point, if, if value grading prices normalize, which you could argue that's never going to happen, but those cards could be sent in more, uh, which is, which just creates more opportunity for collectors like me who love hall of famers. To, that's the, that's the plus of hall of fame hype is it gives us collectors more opportunities to pick things up that we want for our collections. Right. Absolutely. When to, I guess, look at the flip side of that coin, of, you know, when these new wave of Hall of Famers get in each year in the new class, we've already gotten six from the era committees this year. If we get, let's just say for argument's sake, let's say it's Bonds, Clemens, and Schilling somehow all get in this year. That's nine new guys that got in the Hall this year. Now, I would actually take the opposite approach of, okay, these nine guys that just got in, I'm not touching them right now. All the eyeballs are on them. Everybody's trying to buy their stuff. I'm going to go try and get some of the guys that I think are still overlooked or guys that got in the past five years that I may not have yet, that maybe some of the hype has died down for them and the, the prices have softened a bit. Uh, so while, yes, I'll ultimately need a big class that may have just gotten in, I go the opposite way uh, because ultimately I need them all. Uh, so ideally in a perfect world, Mike, we'd want to buy every single card that we need at the right time at the cheapest amount. Right. Sure. And, and you're totally right. I'm not saying go out and buy these guys. Like don't buy a Dick Allen, you know, during the, the crazy hype, but what it does is creates more supply. It trickles down over time. Right. Oh yeah. And that's more absolutely a positive. Yes. You, you know, for example, even, even Hodges who's hot and expensive right now, Hodges autographs, you didn't see that often even on eBay, really, that came up. Right. But now, because he got in, a lot more have surfaced. So that is a positive. You know, you may have to pay up a little more, but now you have more opportunities to buy Hodges at a time when they're actually going to be available. That, that's a good thing, too. One point you brought up that I want to highlight, because I think it's brilliant, is you, you said something when, when everybody's zigging, I'm going to zag. When everybody's focused on these six guys, I want to look at these other guys. And I, I have this picture in my mind, Lord of the Rings, when you know Sauron's eye gets diverted and yep. they create a distraction. Well, the idea there of 
the new Hall of Fame class is now a distraction to Hall of Fame collectors. Mm -hmm. I can go pick up the guys that they're ignoring right now because they're not in. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's a, a brilliant point that I don't want to overlook and, and understate because I think it's a great way to look at it and very smart. Okay, these guys are all popular right now. Buck O'Neill and Minoso and Oliva. Let me go get the Beltres and the, you know, whoever else might be. The Fred McGriffs, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, we haven't even gotten to the guys uh, that are, and I know we're we're running short on time. Not that I have a time limit, but just I want you guys to be entertained, sure, more than bored. But there are plenty of guys in that era committee, future era committee stuff. Think Mark McGuire, think Rafael Palmero, think Juan Gonzalez, Fred McGriff, Dale Murphy, Joe, uh, Lou Whitaker. Um, throw out some other names, Jake, that I'm not thinking about right now that'll come up later in era committees. Carlos Delgado. Carlos Beltran. Carlos no, he'll be Beltran. on the ballot. He's not even on the ballot yet. He's one of those guys. Right. That's not on the CC Zabathia is another guy that's in that not window of yet. not on yeah. the ballot yet, right? Who? He, he's not on the ballot yet, but yes, absolutely. C -C like he's one of those Beltre Ichiro window guys that's in that five-year window. Sabathia is going to be a Hall of Famer. Like again, uh, agree with it, disagree with it. He's going to get in at well, some point, depending on your opinion of this. Uh, but I think that uh, how catchers are looked at in terms of the Hall of Fame is potentially about to evolve, right? Uh, because you've got some big name catchers of this era coming up that what you think is important of their statistics is irrelevant. But I think that it could change with Maurer coming up on the ballot, Posey just retired, and Molina announced his last year. And a lot of those guys, I test wise, are seen as Hall of Famers by a lot of people. And their stats may or may not stack up with some of the current catchers. And I think that's going to change. I think it's a, a good time, especially for Maurer, because uh, he's post hype right now, to prospect him as a future Hall of Famer. Yeah. First of all, I totally think that those three guys will get in. I only think Maurer deserves it. But again, that's my opinion. And it doesn't matter. Right. Right. It doesn't matter. What I You're think. trying to predict what the writers and the committees will do, not what we think. Correct. And, and I want to own them all. If Yachty gets in, great. If, if Posey gets in, great. I think that the, the mindset towards catchers is changing much how it's changed for pitchers over the last mm -hmm. five to 10 years. Well, no one's going to get 300 wins. Or, excuse me. It's highly unlikely anyone's going to get to 300 wins anymore. So how do we reevaluate what a pitcher does? You know, and that Kofax effect of if you're really great for a short period of time as a pitcher, that's good enough. DeGrom is mm -hmm. a great example. Plays on a crappy team. Felix Hernandez is an interesting case. Uh, does he get in the Hall of Fame because he was so dominant on really crappy teams? Want to Cy Young with a losing record? You know, so I just think the mentality towards traditional stats, traditional metrics is shifting. For, it certainly has for pitchers. I think it's moving that way for catchers. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other kind of future era committee guys that are off the ballot for the writers that people that are probably flying under the radar. Is Albert Bell? Is he a yeah. Hall of Famer? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, Steve, Steve Garvey or a right. Johnny Damon, uh, Keith Hernandez, just throwing out some you know possible names. Uh, Johan Santana, kind of one of those short peak guys. Uh, even Louis Tion, you know, for his his short peak and his contributions from the Hispanic Dominican community as a yeah. pitcher for them. Yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Ultimately, Jake and I are not here to be predictors and or soothsayers about who will be in. It's to give you guys food for thought on hey i like this stuff i love getting these players they're all great cards too by the way you're talking about great cards of these guys so you're not wrong adding them to your collection probably whether they get in or not uh just because they're cool and, and fun there was an, oh uh salvi perez is a yeah. thinking of the new catcher era especially after the year he had in 2021 he's now on a lot of people's radar as a future hall of famer and what he's done in his career one world series you know, I mean, he's he's got it putting up building a pretty good resume right mm -hmm. in the new era of evaluating catchers. 
So there's so many names out there uh, to prospect for in this arena. And that's what Jake and I wanted to share with you today is really just thinking about it, getting rookie cards, getting autographs, getting key cards or things that you, that you love to collect now rather than later. Right. When I do have a question for you, Mike, that I think all this leads into, because if I was watching this video, because you know, I, I watch and listen to every episode of golden age cardboard. Thank you. If I was watching this, the question that I would want to know if I was a listener or watcher is Mike, all this stuff's great. But what's your process? What's your philosophy? How do you look at prospecting for Hall of Famers? How do, how do you go about it? If, if you didn't know anything, what yeah. would you tell people? How do you go about it? The irony is it's not that different from collecting Hall of Famers themselves. So however you collect Hall of Famers, think I want to replicate slash duplicate that in my future Hall of Fame guys that I think are, are have a shot down the road. So it's for me getting a rookie card getting uh, signed player error, player error cards, you know, cards from their playing days that they've signed from tops or whatever, getting a slabbed autograph, getting a, a relic card of that player. If they exist um, any five-star autos that they have, I want to get those. So it's not different than collecting hall of famers. When I'm trying to do it now cheaper is, is basically what it is. If that make does that you, you right. And I guess to build upon that question for the, the second part of what I'm getting at. So do you say, okay, I test. I remember watching this guy. I think he's a Hall of Famer. I'm going to go after his stuff as a prospect. Or do you have a, a system to it? Or what do, you, what do you do there? No, it's more of a, wow, I, this is going to sound very non-definitive uh, in the way I answer this. Like, I don't, I know you have a great system that you use and you, have different metrics that you make it very analytical and I'm setting myself what, up. Obviously you did. Yeah. But, and, and I respect the process that you go through. I look at momentum. I look at, you know, kind of, do I think they were or not that I can't take my personal bias out of it. Mm -hmm. I wish I, I wish I could eliminate it. I can't. And so, but I also, like I have Fred McGriff. I think, I think Fred McGriff should be a hall of famer. I'm shocked. He didn't get elected by the writers, quite frankly. Uh, when you look at what he did in the era that he did it most likely very clean. Um, and he was an RBI machine and I saw him and he just, just knocked in runs all the time. Like Fred McGriff to me was a hall of famer. I thought that when he played my so favorite thing to play into it. So my favorite thing to say about Fred McGriff is him not being in the hall. It's a crime dog. Yeah, it is a crime dog, but I wish I had a more, uh, I can't even think of the word. My vocabulary is leaving me in the moment, but it's very much feel gut cost. All of those things play into it. And I kind of go through little phases where, Hey, I'm looking for Lou Whitaker stuff, or I just, Hey, I think Lou's going to get in and I get on a kick you know, and then that kind of, I pick up a few things or whatever. And then I go, Oh, Fred McGriff, man, I can't forget about Fred McGriff. Let me go look for his stuff. Uh, it's never a constant. Cause I have so many guys that I'm looking for that I can't look for them all the time. You have to, but that also keeps it fun by the way. It does. I, I never get bored because I always have a new guy to look for other cards to look for. Ooh, are there any cool autographs? Are they in this set or whatever that, that keeps it actually quite, lively for me and and fun when now the same you, way you mentioned i do I, I think it keeps it fun if you know there's the finish line never is in a set place it it kind of moves a little bit as new hall of famers are elected and we're sure. we're thinking about guys that may get elected and, and that is fun um now different from you mike you know you grew up with your dad working in and around baseball right my dad did not like baseball. So I, I taught myself the history of the game from looking up stats, reading books, all that kind of thing. So if you're not someone who's collected for, you know, 30 years like Mike and you, you didn't watch those guys or you don't know the history of the game and you think who could be a, a potential Hall of Famer, I'd point you first in the direction of the major milestone clubs. 500 home runs, 3,000 hits, 300 wins. 3,000 strikeouts, if they have any of those, 
odds are pretty good that they're going to get in someday. Uh, but even a step down from that, if you, you know, back off those a little bit, let's say a, a close home run total for a, a Hall of Famer. Let's let's just call it 400. If they're in the 400 home run club, hey, decent chance that they might get in someday. And those are easy thresholds to, to take a look at and uh, potentially collect those guys. If you didn't watch them or you don't know the game as well, that you still want to prospect Hall of Famers. I think that's an easy way to look at it. Great advice. Absolutely great advice. With that, man, I, I think we'll wrap this, put a little bow on it since it's Christmas time. Uh, Jake, thanks for being on the show. One last time, tell everybody where they can find you if they want to go see all the great stuff you talk about on your channel. Sure. On uh, YouTube, my channel is Legends Never Die. And on Instagram, I am Legends Never Die Collection. Would love to see you guys over there. Well, awesome. Never a bad time to talk about Hall of Famers, right? Never. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thanks for being here, Jake. Everybody out there, have a Merry Christmas. Uh, Jesus is the reason for the season. So don't forget that. And Amen. thank you guys so much for supporting the channel, supporting this podcast. We'll catch you guys soon and keep collecting.